tolerability speaks to the uh, rate of toxicities that we see with this. And, and um, David uh, mentioned the difference between uh, the toxicities we, uh, or the rates of toxicities with chemo versus pembrolizumab on keynote 024. Um, Jared, first, um, the spectrum of toxicity, very different than chemotherapy. Um, we all have to, you know, it, it's, you know, the, the, there's a trend here, right? When, when the EGFR TKIs came out, we had to be dermatologists. When uh, anti-VEGF agents came out, we had to be cardiologists and internists manage hypertension. Now we've got to become endocrinologists with all these itises in terms of what they And occurred. rheumatologists. Yeah, rheumatologists. Give, yeah. give, us a, give us a kind of an overview of the spectrum of toxicities we see with immune agents, and then we'll talk a little bit more detail about some of these. Sure. So uh, as you pointed out, while these agents may be less toxic than doublet chemotherapy, they are not toxicity free and they are not risk free. So the most common uh, autoimmune effects that we're seeing from this class of agents are endocrine. And within those, uh, as uh, was alluded to, um, hyper and hypothyroidism um, are high on the list of what we're seeing most often. In my practice, I do monitor patients for thyroid function. Um, I get a TSH every few um, every few treatments. And these are usually easily manageable with uh, levothyroxine or, or carbimazole, depending on which direction uh, you're going in. For other endocrine disruption, you sometimes might need a uh, consultation with an endocrinologist. Um, and certainly for those in the early goings of managing these, uh, I would encourage a very low threshold um, to use uh, such consultation. Um, you can see hyperglycemia that um, is and is not type 1 diabetes. So you can see a frank autoimmune um, type 1 diabetes type picture, um, or you can just see high sugars. Um, and pretty much anywhere else in the endocrine uh, axis, someone has reported um, a mild or severe uh, toxicity, the most feared being hypophysitis. Mm -hmm. On the more severe end of the spectrum, um, patients, particularly those with a heavy smoking history, uh, are at risk for pneumonitis. We're talking about a percent or two of patients. Uh, but this can be pretty severe. Um, patients can be very short of breath. They can be hypoxic. There's a classic imaging appearance that um, can help when there's a doubt with this. These need to be recognized very promptly. These are ones you need to warn patients about, that if they get more short of breath, that they need to come in quickly, that you need to get imaging rapidly. And the gist of this is that you need to get them on high-dose steroids uh, rather quickly, uh, perhaps a milligram per kilogram or so of prednisone. And they need that to be tapered very, very slowly. Uh, in some cases, uh, pulmonary consultation uh, can be very helpful. We also fear autoimmune colitis, although this seems to be uh, rarer than with the CTLA-4 experience. Um, again, the first-line treatment is high-dose steroids and stopping the agent um, while they're on it. And then there are rarer toxicities um, that are seen. Um, and I think that when those are seen, it's helpful to speak with someone who's seen a lot of toxicities from these drugs, uh, who's used them a lot, either in practice uh, or in trials, and to bring in the relevant uh, uh, subspecialist to assist with their management. Yeah, the, the thing that, um, you know, I think other um, uh, physicians need to be aware of, too, is that, you know, when you look at the, the, the time to onset of these toxicities, you know, most of them occur relatively early. But you know these are Not things that yeah these are things that can occur kind of at any point and and you know I used to emphasize to the to the fellows in Pittsburgh that you know oftentimes these patients tolerate these agents extremely well it's almost like you let your guard down because yep. Mrs Jones mm -hmm. is doing so well and then Mrs Jones starts to have something that's grade one that gets a little blown off and then all of a sudden you know Mrs Jones has a grade three toxicity that could have been recognized earlier and dealt with earlier with uh, appropriate supportive care including steroids. So. Absolutely and that early supportive care is not just because you don't want Ms. Jones to suffer in the moment although that's a good yeah. enough reason to bring her in and yeah. give her high dose steroids. There's a good literature from the melanoma that we're starting to explore more in uh, lung cancer to show that if you do aggressively treat that early that some of these patients may be able to get back on drug and benefit. Yeah, and, and, I've, and I've actually, um, in some patients that I've seen in consultation that then go back to their primary mm -hmm. oncologist, I, I've had a few oncologists say to me that they didn't, they, they withheld steroids for the fear of blunting any sort of, sort of immune response. Tracy, have you heard this? Well, yeah, I mean, that's a fear of mine, too. A lot of the studies excluded people on steroids, but if they're having one of these autoimmune right. events, you absolutely have to treat right. it. You need right. to get it under control, or it can be very dangerous. There have been fatal episodes of pneumonitis. Yeah. yeah. 
So what's amazing to me with these drugs is there's no predictable toxicity. I know when I give cytotoxic chemotherapy, you're going to have some nausea and vomiting, if, especially yeah. if I don't give you antiemetics. You're going to have some fatigue. Your counts are going to go down. But many people getting these agents have absolutely no toxicity. You don't need to give any supportive care drugs, which is just so amazing when you're writing the, the chemotherapy orders. It's just the drug. And yet you're going to get these random, rare toxicities that you've never seen before. I had one patient who had this very severe headache and an aseptic meningitis picture which I then looked up and yes, can happen. Um, I had another patient who had a polymyalgia rheumatica type syndrome, which makes sense that that's a, you know, immune based and, and his joints really ached and he needed to stay on a low dose prednisone, yet it seemed like that didn't uh, impact the drug's ability to work. Um, in all of these trials, patients with prior autoimmune diseases were excluded. I think I saw at ASCO uh, last year that if you look in the SEER database, about 25% of the lung cancer population would have something that one could consider a history of autoimmune diseases, and they probably were excluded from this. Many of these are not well documented, maybe very remote. What do you do in these situations? Do you ignore them? Or, or, or what advice do you have for community docs? For me, I eventually ignore them, meaning I'm not going to let somebody <laughs> with lung cancer die of their disease right. because of some autoimmune disease without having seen a checkpoint inhibitor. Um, where I might use it will depend on how severe whatever disease they have is, I mean, how concerned I am about it. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So I might not use Pembro first line in spite of high expression if somebody has just really severe lupus or severe um, maybe, I don't know about rheumatoid arthritis. But you know, if there's some severe condition, severe colitis that they already have, I might be more relaxed to use it, but they'll get it eventually, because and I'll use steroids if I need to. You know, our melanoma colleagues who've been using these drugs, uh, oh, at least you. checkpoint inhibitors in general, a few years longer than us, have over time reported that they're relaxing those mm -hmm. thresholds yes. yeah. and that they largely um, they largely get away with it. One place that I'm less tempted to try to get away with it is ILD, um, where uh, people seem to get into trouble at a, a much higher rate. So, having said that, the next question I was going to ask is, uh, would you rechallenge? Um, after a, an immune-related adverse event. You're kind of hinting that with, the, with an ILD type, which you probably wouldn't re-challenge. I would not. You would not, yeah. Others? With pre-existing ILD or no, someone no, no, who gets no. pneumonitis so who had from a the pneumonitis, drugs? No, so I've had a, so, so that's a really important distinction. Someone with pre-existing ILD, um, I'm certainly pushing this to later lines, if ever at all. That, mm -hmm. That's a high note of yep. caution for me. Patient, I have already had, um, even outside of trials, as in standard of care use, Patients who have had pneumonitis, including at least one rather dramatic pneumonitis, got high dose steroids, got better from it, have gotten back on drug and have benefited. Um, and that's been reported more extensively in the literature. That's very real. And I've done that too, but what gives me some pause is the fact that in patients who've had to go off these agents because of toxicities, even when they benefit, they can have a durable benefit even without going back on it. So I do feel nervous about right. taking that risk. Which brings up um, you know, one of the issues that I think we have to deal with at some point, not during this, but at some point in clinical research is duration of therapy with these agents because uh, they're very costly and if we can get away with shorter durations then, then it it, with the same outcome, uh, that that would be helpful. Uh, Ed, I want to get back to you. I want to ask you the quick question. There's been, I've heard theoretical arguments as to why PDL1 inhibitors may be less toxic than PD1 inhibitors. The clinical data has, I mean, the severe toxicities occur so uncommonly that it's hard to cross trials, say that one is clearly better than the other. Do you, do you have any sense or you just kind of see them all as the same from, yeah. from a side effect? You know, I think what we're, we're still very nascent in this and we rely on one of our immunotherapy docs who does melanoma and renal cell and did high dose IL-2 before you want some side effects, you know, go to, yeah. a, go to a high dose IL-2 program. Yeah. So we, you know, we rarely have those patients admitted anymore to the ICU beds like we used to. Uh, but uh, I, you know, when you, when you use their expertise because they have been dealing with this. I think when we do this next year or when we have topics next year, we're going to be talking about the combos. And, uh, you know, this, this ain't nothing yet, you know. <laughs> just, just wait for those. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're sort of dabbling in the minor leagues right now, according to them, because uh, you start adding on the additional agents on top of these, whether it's CTLA-4, PD-1, PDL one or I, the IOs seem to be less as far as some of them, the IDOs. But uh, 
it's, uh, I think it's going to uh, definitely take a different shape and a different form, uh, even as we uh, start looking at combos with chemo. I, I do think we're, we should hopefully learn the lessons that we have with other eligibility criteria. And I think that's an important one that you brought up is you know, brain metastases, for God's sakes. You know, a 15-year-old versus an 18-year-old. You know, this is a movement we're trying to push out there that, you know, a 12-year-old metabolizes drugs the same way as an 18-year-old, yet for some reason it's something magic when you're 18 and, and that, you know, you get to be on a clinical trial or treatment and, and others don't. So I, hopefully we will be more receptive to change, especially with some of these history of, of you know, autoimmune diseases to treat patients and not leave people out in the dark because right now those community docs, they're hearing sort of some different messages here and there. Some of them are not using steroids. I absolutely believe in stopping, giving the steroids that you need, get them tapered down and get them restarted. I frankly personally had more issues with elevated liver function tests, uh, which is very frustrating because the patient looks fine in front of you. They're not short of breath. They're not having weird thyroid symptoms or anything. And their LFTs are just staying up. Yeah, you, 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 yeah you, you're treating a number. That's right. Yeah. And, and it's very challenging because uh, uh, I've gone through this with one patient where we've tried actually two different uh, uh, immunotherapies now, and both times there was a bump in the LFTs. And I, the last, and that's just where I get scared. I, I totally believe that there is a lasting effect when you have a response. And this, of course, happened to her. She had a response, and then her LFTs bumped up. So I said, don't worry. It's around. It's around. And then, of course, we restaged her, and it's grown and doubled in size, of course. So, you know, we had to get her back on a different one right away. So it's going to always be the one. Uh, we're in the process of looking at it right now. So.